The Wagner Group has become notorious internationally for the high-profile role its troops have played in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Wagner is principally a private military enterprise with close links to the Russian state where it is now registered as a legal entity. According to the UK Ministry of Defence, Wagner almost certainly now commands up to 50,000 fighters in Ukraine and has become a key component of the Ukraine campaign. Ukrainian troops have said that large numbers of Wagner fighters were sent over open ground, with many killed as a result. But the group's operations are global in scope. Wagner's presence in Africa has expanded aggressively since 2017 and is now considered one of the most prominent forms of Russian influence in Africa. But this presence is fraught. The Wagner Group has been accused of gold smuggling, human rights abuses, and battering mercenary services to political elites in exchange for access to mineral resources. It has also been accused of offering financial support and a variety of services to candidates in African elections. And in late January 2023, the U.S. announced that it would designate Wagner as a transnational criminal organization. So, let's take a look. What exactly is the private military group Wagner doing in Africa? Companies linked to the Wagner Group operate in African countries in three main areas, military, political, and economic. Wagner has largely been employed by weakened autocratic governments who need support fighting insurgencies, rebel groups, or civil wars. Wagner troops have been documented in Mali, Sudan, Central African Republic, Libya, and formerly Mozambique. But Wagner has actually engaged with even more countries politically than it has militarily. There are a number of different political organizations, think tanks and so on, uh, which are ultimately linked back to Yevgeny Prigozhin, the head of Wagner, and so form part of this broader ecosystem or network of organizations which, which make up the group. And their strategies include promoting disinformation campaigns on social media and targeting that at populations in different African countries, you know, giving financial and strategic support to different candidates and elections which are deemed to be, you know, in favour in favor of Wagner's interests and even doing things like paying protesters who will protest against Western and in some cases, such as in the Central African Republic, UN interests in a particular country. The Central African Republic is the most developed example of the Wagner business model in Africa, to the point where its interventions could be described as state capture. Wagner has provided President Faustine Akanj Tordera with the military and political support, which has proven pivotal in sustaining his embattled presidency against an onslaught of rebuild groups. The uh, initial goal of their deployment was to train uh, the uh, militaries uh, in the Central African Republic. Because after uh, the start of the civil war in that country in uh, 2013, uh, the army disintegrated and therefore it was necessary to reconstruct uh, the, the military institution. The European Union sent uh, a, training, a military training mission to do that. But the car government was unhappy with the, the, the kind of training provided uh, by the, the European Union and uh, uh, decided to employ the Wagner Group because it wanted uh, its militaries to be trained for combat, uh, mostly, mostly. And the European Union was not ready to do that given the very bad uh, human rights records of the car military. But Wagner mercenaries in Africa have perpetrated grave human rights abuses. In October 2021, a group of UN experts called on the Central African Republic government to end their relationship with the Wagner Group, based on the group's systematic and grave human rights and international humanitarian law violations, including arbitrary detention, torture, disappearances, and summary execution. In exchange for its political and military services in many African countries, Wagner is either paid directly or granted access to natural resources. Their services are paid in, uh, uh, seems to be paid in gold or 
at least in uh, Sudan and CAR. In Mali, it's uh, unclear at the moment. It seems that they uh, are paid uh, by the government, directly by the government in cash. And in the Central African Republic, uh, the Wagner Group started with the mining uh, sectors and uh, especially uh, gold uh, concessions that were allocated to one of his uh, companies. And now they have diversified into the logging uh, industry and also they try to, uh, to get involved into the agribusiness. Wagner has developed a footprint in many African economies. We can see this more clearly through the companies linked to the person who ultimately controls the Wagner network, Yevgeny Prigozhin, who is also known as Putin's chef. He's a close ally of Vladimir Putin, at one time providing catering services to Putin and Russian government ministries to the company Concord Management and Consulting. The interesting thing is that Prigozhin, who has been denounced as everything from a, a terrorist to a gangster to a Kremlin insider, in some ways he kind of encapsulates the whole of this, this uh, rather confused blending of different kind of functions within Putin's regime. I mean, this is after all a man who himself has served time in prison as a criminal, a violent criminal at that, and has in turn also raised forces for Wagner in Russia's prison system. He's a businessman, he's someone who clearly sort of has operated within the underworld, and he is someone who also has very sort of close political links with the Kremlin, even if he's certainly not in any way a close Putin crony or, or similar. And this kind of model, I think really sort of one can find all the way across the whole Concord group of companies, including Wagner, is essentially not so much a willful desire to break the law, so much as a, a willingness to just ignore the laws when it's inconvenient and gets in the way of profit. So one sees Concord operations which are entirely legitimate and legal, and then we have others which are clearly illegitimate and illegal, and many of them operate sort of very much in the kind of grey zone, to use the phrase, in, in between. In order to understand what is meant by grey zone, we need to look at organised crime in Russia generally which has evolved significantly over the past three decades. Amid changing economic and political conditions within the country and a changing relationship between organized crime and the state. Let's go back to 1991. Since the fall of the Soviet Union, organized crime has expanded aggressively in Russia. State assets were privatized and the Russian state lacked the resources to effectively enforce order. As a result, criminality and violence exploded. Less than 10 years later, Putin became president and this relationship shifted. When Putin came to office in 1999-2000, it was very, very clear that he wanted to reassert this notion that the state was back. So the word went out to the underworld that, look, you can continue to settle your scores violently, but you have to do so with precision. You can't do so in ways that makes it look as if the state is weak. And in fact, that's exactly what, what the criminals did. They continued to murder each other, but with precision instead of with indiscriminacy. There's often this uh, easy characterization of Russia as a mafia state, which, to be perfectly honest, is not one that I'm very happy with, because it implies that either the gangsters run the government or the government runs the gangsters. And neither of these is truly accurate. Instead, what we have is a situation in which, to use a Russian word, there are ponyatia, there are understandings. This evolution has influenced how Russian organized crime has developed its footprint overseas, including in Africa. It's important to note that the complex corporate structure linked to Prigozhin doesn't necessarily indicate criminality, nor does it indicate all of the companies are involved in criminal activities. However, if we look closely, we will see indications that some of the operations do not appear to be above board. In July 2022, CNN reported on a Russian aircraft sat on Khartoum runway in Sudan, which was supposed to be loaded with a shipment of cookies. But when the plane was inspected by Sudanese officials, they discovered one ton of gold. According to CNN, senior army brass intervened and this plane still took off. The article doesn't directly say who actually owned the plane or who was shipping the gold. But we do know that it was heading to Latakia in Syria, which is the site of a Russian military base. 
However, if we then look at an investigation by the Financial Times into another shipment of cookies, this time from Russia to Sudan in April 2020, we can see more links to some of the companies in Prigozhin's complicated corporate structure. The Financial Times say, according to Russian export data, the vast shipment of goods labeled as gingerbread cookies sent by RN Trading on April 30th, 2020, went to a company in Khartoum called Moreau for Agricultural and Animal Production, which shares a similar name and the same address as Moreau Gold, a sanctioned company. That's the same Moreau Gold, which is part of Evgeny Prigozhin's corporate structure. This is just one example that links Wagner with gold smuggling out of Africa. Wagner's operations, particularly in mining, have been described really as a, as a major sanctions busting operation, particularly because, you know, in, in the countries in which they've negotiated access to, to economic resources, they're really engaged in quite industrial scale smuggling of those. So this is, for example, gold smuggling out of, out of Sudan, where, you know, whistleblowers Within, within this system have highlighted that they've been using military airports to move gold in vast quantities out of the country. Um, and that provides this you know, source of alternative revenue. Illicit gold markets and gold laundering may be one way Moscow and other sanctioned actors could seek to generate profits and move finances across borders as Russia finds itself increasingly cut off from foreign currencies and financial systems. Western countries have imposed sanctions against Russian financial institutions, state-owned businesses, and business people in response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We're banning all imports of Russian oil and gas and energy. We are proposing to add almost 200 additional individuals and entities to our sanctions list. We will continue on a remorseless mission to squeeze Russia from the global economy piece by piece, day by day, and week by week. Broad sanctions on Russian financial institutions, including their suspension from international payment systems such as SWIFT, are disrupting a significant part of Russian trade relations with Africa. As a result, Russia has been working to make its economy more resilient to sanctions, including stockpiling gold and foreign exchange reserves and diversifying away from the US dollar. Russia held more gold than US dollars for the first time in June 2020, when it accounted for almost 23% of the total reserves. But while Russia may be able to access gold markets in countries that have not adopted sanctions regimes, such as Sudan, it will still face challenges in building and accessing foreign exchange reserves when trying to sell the gold. This is in part because anyone transacting in U.S. dollars with the sanctioned entities can be targeted by U.S. authorities. Not to mention that the sanctions will make gold buyers wary of engaging with Russian actors in any currency. So even where there are willing gold buyers, it's likely to be in small amounts or its Russian origins will be disguised. However, they can evade these restrictions if they engage in gold and money laundering to obscure the origins of the gold and the beneficiaries of the gold profits. Clearly, the ability to circumvent and navigate sanctions around the world, including in Africa, um, is you know a, you know furthers Russia's ability to undermine the international rules-based order, you know undermine rule of law, and to really continue to continue to finance its operations in Ukraine. In just a few years, Wagner has become a major means of engagement between Russia and Africa. The group is an example of where business and politics converge in Russia's projection into Africa. And as we've already explained, there's a reason to believe that those business activities are not always legitimate. For complete details of the Global Initiative's investigation, please see our report, The Grey Zone.